So today I'm quite excited to have Gerardo and Dong Zhang here from Sambe Kim's group at MIT. And they already shared some exciting stories about the mini cheetah and how they used it during the lockdown. And I'm quite excited, excited to hear more about the robot and maybe we hear also a little bit more about the big cheetah and what the future for this robot will be. So I would like to start with Gerardo now. Maybe you can start sharing your slides. All right. Okay, great. It's everything's working. Yes, we can see it well. Okay, perfect. The stage is yours. Okay, perfect. Um, all right. Oh, hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Gerardo. Uh, I'm working in uh, Dr. Sangbei Kim's lab, uh, Biomedic Robotics Lab. Uh, so I'm going to give a short talk on um, pretty much on the controller that I made during my PhD. Uh, I call it regularized predictive control. Uh, and I want to talk specifically about how using very simple models for optimization can actually sometimes help you more than making a more complex model. Um, so I'll talk about the, like, the simplifications that I made for the optimization to make it robust and dynamic. Um, so a little overview of the talk. Uh, first, I'm gonna talk about um, like the model choices that I actually made for the controller. Um, basically, how accurate do you need to make your model uh, to get everything to work? Um, there's a certain level of complexity that you can make your model. Um, and if that's actually necessary or not for you to do. Uh, then I'll give a short overview on the controller itself, uh, called Regularized Predictive Control, or RPC, um, and how it's actually a very simple nonlinear optimization, but through embedding a bunch of uh, heuristics, uh, you can actually improve the performance without ever having to uh, change the optimization itself without having to change any of the optimization gains and using a simple dynamics model for uh, your robot. And then finally, hopefully, I'll be able to convince you guys that uh, I'm able to achieve robust behaviors uh, and get a, like a wide variety of situations that the robot can handle even without um, changing any of the models or uh, adding anything different to the optimization. So first I'll go through um, what I call the simple potato model. It's, the, it's basically just a simple rigid body model where you have one body, uh, you treat the legs as massless. Um, so you ever only need to track the center of mass position, orientation, uh, velocities, and angular velocities. Um, and as inputs to the system, we're taking footstep locations relative to the center of mass uh, and ground reaction forces at those footstep locations. And with that, we get enough control to basically manipulate the body uh, orientation positions the way that we want to. Um, so even though we're using the massless leg assumption, um, we're still able to gain a decent amount of control for whatever we need. We're basically capturing the main uh, system dynamics through the simple model. Uh, this gives us like a very linear form of the dynamics where normally if you have the legs, you'd have a bunch of nonlinear terms and you have much more states that you have to track for all the joint positions, joint velocities and everything. Um, so I'm going to try to justify if this model is good enough uh, for the robot that we need. Um, so this slide basically uh, is called, is a robot really a potato? Um, a lot of people have trouble with, uh, with the concept that you can basically model your entire robot as just a single rigid body. Um, so some of the questions that I asked myself when actually designing the, uh, the control system, um, first, do we actually need to include the leg dynamics? Uh, it's a pretty important part of the robot as you're walking around, the legs are moving, they're doing a lot of things. Uh, you're expecting that uh, as the legs move around, they'll have some sort of effects on the center of mass. Uh, then you need to consider things like, is the ground model required for uneven terrain? Um, say you're stepping onto something, uh, you'd expect uh, maybe you need to add in some sort of ground model. Um, then do we add the dynamics in the cost function or do we just treat it as completely separate uh, states at every time step? Uh, 
also do we benefit from having non-zero orientations, meaning that we uh, can we use the zero pitch and roll assumption or is it or do we need the full orientation dynamics? Um, and then uh, the way that I presented it for the simple potato model, um, do we need forces and torques to be in the same uh, relative frame to each other? Uh, so basically what I found out was the answer to all these questions, for, at least for our system, was that no, we don't need to do any of these. Uh, so in the case of leg dynamics, you end up adding 24 decision variables per time step, uh, and that grows as, as your uh, prediction horizon increases. It adds a lot of nonlinear terms that are pretty difficult to solve in an optimization. And since our robot, the total uh, mass of the legs compared to the body is around or less than 10%, uh, the effects are actually pretty negligible. Uh, for the ground model, you end up adding uh, a lot of non-sparsity of the gradients, which is pretty favorable uh, to have sparse gradients for optimization. Um, for the dynamics, you can, you can basically treat every time step as something completely separate in the cost function um, since they're handled as a constraint in the optimization anyway. Uh, adding in them in basically increases your computation time by 3.5 uh, times what you would without it. Uh, same with the zero pitch and roll assumption. Uh, as long as the robot's not doing anything crazy like flips or anything like that, you can get about 80 to 90% uh, force accuracy up to about 45 degrees uh, pitch and roll, which is pretty good and it covers most of the cases that we would ever need. Uh, same with the forces and torques. In the way that I designed the optimization, um, you don't need them to be in the same frame, which is kind of non intuitive when you're thinking about it. Um, but the optimization itself is uh, like the solver doesn't have any any sense of dynamics within it. Um, so you can easily transform them before and after into whatever frame the robot actually takes your commands in. So basically, yes, the robot is well modeled by this simple potato model, even though it's a complex system that moves around and there's things going on with it. Um, so I'll, I'll go through a quick overview of RPC. This is also presented in the paper that I, uh, I submitted to ICRA, but um, but basically decision variables are future states and inputs over some prediction horizon. Um, and the key thing with the algorithm is that we don't have an error term where you're, um, where you're basically trying to track some desired state. You instead have this heuristic function uh, where you can embed a bunch of simple rules um, such as things like uh, capture point or forward stepping heuristics, um, basically step in the direction that you want to or pretty much anything else that you can think to embed. Um, and this takes care of a lot of the cases where maybe we do need a more complicated model. Um, instead of adding that in through the dynamic constraints, you can add it in as uh, regularization through the optimization. And you get a similar effect in the optimization itself without changing the structure of the actual problem. Uh, so finally, we're gonna solve a nonlinear optimization in real time. And through the use of these uh, regularization heuristics, even though you're adding more information, you're actually making the problem easier to solve um, rather than more difficult to solve by adding decision variables or adding in constraints that are probably unnecessary. Um, so I'll also talk about um, the constraints that I added to the robot. I basically found what I would call the minimum physical feasibility uh, for a legged robot. So the first thing that you do is you uh, constrain it to your simplified dynamics. And this is more of a rough feasibility constraint instead of uh, kind of like a strict high fidelity model. You're basically taking it as a rough plan that the robot is able to actually do this um, while letting a high update rate uh, take care of all the little, little problems that may occur. Uh, then you have to make sure the foot is placed on the ground. Uh, you have to make sure your feet are within the kinematic limits of the leg. Um, you, you have this um, basically no slip constraint that we add to the robot, um, but it's, the robot is able to slip. Uh, as long as your update rate is high enough, um, you, you can basically take care of any problems that might occur uh, during slips. And then finally, you want to have a, gr a positive ground force normal and you want to adhere to your friction cone. 
So basically, uh, I'll try to justify why or what exactly heuristic regularization does within the optimization. So uh, in the first video, you can see the naive MPC case where we're basically just trying to have a robot stand in place while trotting. Um, and it's a nonlinear optimization. So you're prone to a lot of different local minima and you can kind of see the robot uh, freaking around or yeah, basically freaking out and like putting its legs all over the place as it jumps around different local minima, which is pretty unfavorable. Um, so I came up with an analytical heuristic, which basically says, it'd be nice if the robot put its feet kind of under, um, basically under where the hips are. Um, and this, you add this to the cost function, which uh, ends up changing the cost space itself, even though the optimization doesn't change in structure or form, you can shape the cost function to be more favorable. Um, and now in the second video, you see that the robot is running the same exact optimization, just with this added heuristic it is much more well behaved um, and it's actually able to stand up correctly. So a big thing with this is making sure that the heuristics that you add are meaningful. Um, so in the case where you're standing in place, it's pretty obvious that uh, putting the feet under the, under the hips is a pretty good solution. Um, so you wanna bias your solutions to, um, to match your heuristics, but you also don't want to over constrain it and you want to let the optimization search around in cases when you have disturbances or situations you don't necessarily expect. So an example of bad regularization is uh, placing the feet directly under the hips when you're actually moving around. So you see that the robot when it's standing is fine, but as it starts moving around, um, the, regular, or the regularization heuristic of putting it under the hips is actually detrimental to the robot and it starts uh, getting its feet caught on itself and just basically lagging behind the robot too much. Uh, whereas a good regularization, um, I'll talk about how I built this up, but it'll adapt to the situation and it'll move your optimum around to where you want it to be. So the goal is to shape the cost, but not change where the actual optimal would be. Um, so you want it to still take into account all of those underlying dynamics that come with the robot, um, and you kind of want to try to figure out a heuristic for all possible cases in some kind of general way. Uh, so to do this, um, there are different ways you can do it. You can observe nature, uh, you can analyze the physics of the robot, um, you can use a data-driven approach, or uh, some people use learning methods for this. So the way that I did it previously before the paper uh, that I presented at this ICA was the first two where you just observe nature and you kind of analyze physics for what you think would be an intuitive solution. Uh, but as the robot begins to do more and more complicated things, it becomes more difficult to actually come up with these different heuristics. Uh, so for the paper, I, um, I developed this method of running the optimization offline and running a bunch of different explorations for different cases that you want the robot to, um, to basically be able to operate in. Um, and then you use data-driven analysis to extract different trend lines and different models and basically simple models for the robot that describe uh, how it moves generally uh, when you're running the optimization offline. Because when you run it offline and you're able to pause time, you're able to fully explore your cost space, and you're not uh, restricted to the real-time computation limits of the robot online. So as an example, one of, the, um, one of the models that I found was this model relating forward velocity and pitch. Uh, and this can come from any, any number of things. Uh, but what, what happens to the robot is as it moves forward, it begins to pitch down. Uh, this could be the faster moving legs um, are actually causing an angular uh, or basically have angular acceleration, which causes the body to pitch in the direction, um, either forward or backwards, depending on which way the robot's going. Uh, it could be due to timing delays where we're not actually getting the robot to step where it wants to be. Um, but we find this simple rule um, that basically says it has a generally linear relationship. And since the process is iterative, we run it one more time on a different exploration set. Um, and we find this other relationship between the gait phase of the robot as it trots around, it's a, basically a periodic gait. Um, and the pitch of the robot will have a sinusoidal pattern um, based on the like cyclic nature of the gait. 
Um, so these are two pretty simple models, just basically just a sine wave and a first order polynomial. Uh, but when you add them together, you get this complex heuristic um, that actually describes the robot's pitch as it moves forward and as the gait occurs. Uh, and you're able to capture these very comp like complex dynamics that happen in the robot using simple models. And you're now able to correct for the forward pitch and you're able to control the, um, the pitch during the gate phase. Uh, and you can also input this as a heuristic which will uh, have the robot embrace these natural dynamics instead of trying to fight against them by basically trying to overcorrect or uh, tell it that it's not dynamically feasible when it is actually the only dynamically feasible solution uh, for the robot. Um, so I'll, I'll quickly go through some examples of other heuristics, um, but in the case where you just have it stepping under the hips as it moves forward, it begins to pitch forward. Um, so one of the extracted heuristics was this forward stepping heuristic, which basically tells you to put the feet in the direction that you're moving. Uh, next, we found one very similar for turning rate uh, or for turns, um, where you basically put your foot in the direction that you're turning. Uh, then we found another one that uh, combines the two uh, in a different way um, and it's for high speed turning because the effects when you're actually moving at high speed and turning at the same time get a little weird on the robot. So this is an example where it's actually difficult to come up with an analytical solution for it, but we can extract it um, by running the simulation offline and letting the optimization find uh, what what comes out being the optimal solution, um, even though we don't know for sure that it's any kind of global optimal or anything like that, but it gives us a good enough solution uh, where we can tackle these different cases. And then finally, we, we add these uh, orientation heuristics that I talked about on the previous slide, and the robot's able to move around at much higher speeds. Uh, it's able to be controlled in situations that wasn't previously, even though we haven't changed the controller at all. Um, Basically what I'm saying is uh, if you give the robot a better input um, for what you want it to be doing, you'll get better results. Um, so uh, I'll quickly go through this again, um, but we can see in the naive MPC case where we have no regularization heuristics or uh, no simple models that we're feeding the robot as far as what we want it to be able to do and it has no real concept of uh, what it should be doing, but as we start adding more and more heuristics, you'll see that the performance of the robot increases. Uh, again, we haven't added any anything to the optimization itself. The number of uh, variables to solve, the computation time should be the same. Uh, in fact, it actually gets lower because now you're, you're giving it an initial guess that includes the natural dynamics of the robot, even though they're not included in the actual dynamics model you're giving it a better result, which is where the robot should eventually converge to anyway. So you can see as we add more and more uh, heuristics, we're able to get better performance um, until we get the full RPC that I'm using currently, and we're able to do these dynamic maneuvers uh, that we couldn't have done without them. Um, so to show some of the capabilities of the robot um, that I would consider highly dynamic, um, we have the robot turning in place at uh, about two pi radians per second, so like one full turn every second. Uh, and we can increase or decrease the gate frequency. And since we have it parametrized in, um, in the heuristics, uh, it doesn't really matter. The heuristics will, uh, they're generalizable to a bunch of different control inputs. And then we have this high speed turning, um, which is something I haven't seen robots be able to do a lot. Um, a lot of robots strive to be the fastest robot or, uh, tackle some different case, but I haven't seen any take uh, very quick dynamic turns like this where it'll immediately start going the, the other way. Um, so this was a very exciting result for me. Uh, and even though all the heuristics are active at all times, there are different heuristics that are more or less important depending on the situation that the robot's currently doing. Um, so kind of to prove that even though the simple potato model that I described and the simple heuristics are, um, are capable of handling a bunch of different cases, uh, I'll show some experiments dealing with robustness where we have impulse pushes, 
we have sustained pulls on the center of mass. We're walking over rough terrain. Uh, that at this point the robot is blind. Uh, so the controller itself is blind. It has no concept of what's in front of it or uh, what it's actually stepping on. Um, but it's able to tackle all of these cases pretty easily. You can basically hit the legs around as you're uh, as you're trotting in place, and it's able to adapt. Um, and a lot of this robustness comes not from like good design for the uh, controller gains, or um, I'm not going to pretend that the model for the robot is anything special, uh, but having these simple different rules for the robot allow it, the computation time to be really fast, and it can constantly replan, um, basically just replan its uh, predicted trajectory at every step. Uh, and it does this at about 150 hertz, which is pretty fast for a nonlinear optimization running on the robot. Um, so even besides this, uh, I had kind of planned for these robustness experiments that I expected, but some unplanned results that kind of show the power of the algorithm. Uh, we have this case where we're actually feeding it uh, the potato model, but we're, get, we're telling it that the dimensions of the potato are smaller. So now it thinks it's very, it's a very small robot, even though it's not, but it's able to tackle this pretty easily. Um, we give it this like compliant slippery platform that we can disturb uh, and it's compliant. So even though the robot doesn't have any kind of ground model, since it replans so fast, it's able to deal with the changing ground. Um, since we don't have any kind of leg dynamics in the actual optimization, it doesn't matter which way the leg's pointing. So we can flip it backwards or forwards, online, it doesn't really matter. Um, and so basically these are just different cases that I, uh, that I tried um, without having actually designed uh, the controller for, and they were able to tackle them pretty easily. Uh, it's able to fall off platforms about its body height without any major disturbances. Uh, you can just straight up drop it from about head height and the robot will recover and it'll keep walking. Um, and sloped surfaces, it can handle just fine, even though it's using a flat ground assumption. Cool, so hopefully I've been able to kind of convince you that the, the robot's dynamic capabilities are, uh, they aren't limited by the complexity of the control model. Um, by including all of these different uh, different rules and heuristics as regularization heuristics, you can make up a lot of the deficiencies that come from um, that come from having a simple model, basically. So uh, I'll kind of go through my thoughts on what I think good control design should be. Um, so I think you should find the what I call the simple potato model for your robot or your task. Uh, where you find the simplest model that reasonably captures the dynamics of your system. Um, you, you only really need to solve a problem as complex as it needs to be. You don't need to add complexity just for the sake of having a better model or a more accurate model. Um, and you want to find kind of clever ways to get around this. Uh, so the way that I did it was by adding the regularization heuristics where we run the robot and gather data and see, okay, there might be a problem here. Um, let's add a heuristic to compensate for that instead of adding um, whatever fix might be uh, causing this. Um, and then definitely test on your hardware. Um, there's really no substitute. Even if your simulator is amazing, there's just things that you might not get unless you actually test on the robot. Uh, just things that you visually see what that happened or sounds that the robot might make that you don't get from your simulator. Um, and then of course, iterate the model as needed. Uh, if I had needed to add, say, leg dynamics, I would have. Um, in, in the case of the Mini Cheetah, it was designed for having light limbs, so we didn't need to do this. Um, but you have to be open to basically being wrong and saying, okay, the model that I chose wasn't good enough for the problem that I'm trying to solve. Uh, how do I change the model to be able to solve this. Um, and the RPC that I presented, I think, gives you a good framework for injecting a lot of rich information about the system uh, to the optimization without adding any complexity to the structure, which means you're solving a pretty simple optimization problem, even though there's a lot of uh, important information embedded within it. Um, 
So this was kind of a quote that I wrote in the abstract, but basically that the task of a control designer is to find a controller that robustly achieves the desired performance rather than to describe the system accurately. So you could have a perfect model of your robot, but if you're able to achieve just as good results with a simple model, um, it may not be necessary to make the problem more complicated than it needs to be. So hopefully I've um, given you guys some some insight into how the cheetah control system works and um, hopefully this helps you with whatever uh, control problems you might be facing. So, thanks. So I would propose that we continue with Dongjan and then that we um, answer the question in the end. Okay, okay. nice. Uh, let me share my screen. Right. Sure. Was that everything good? Looks yes. good. We can see it correct. Okay. <clears throat> uh, thank you. I'm Dong Hyun, postdoc in MIT. Going to talk about whole body impulse control and vision AD dynamic locomotion. So, uh, Geraldo just presented a state of art model predictive control. And now we need to put this ingredient in the right place in a right way. So I'm going to talk about the present how we created the control architectures to accomplish the maximum capability of the uh, legacy system. Architecturing is actually as important as developing the uh, component. And, and also, actually, uh, it, include uh, many times architecture include uh, formulating new algorithm. <clears throat> Let me first visit the pros and cons of the each components. So model predictive control is a nice control framework to find the optimal trajectory, optimal inputs for long time horizon motions. It understand uh, entire motion and behavior that's why sometimes you find the non-trivial solutions and also find the, uh, provide a robust controllability, uh, even in the very general form. But because it's solving the uh, optimal optimization problem in real time, it's computationally expensive. And that's why in many cases, people only use the simplified models and should use the slow update frequency. On the other hand, whole body control uh, use the full body dynamics to find the torque command. So we can expect that it has actually uh, has the more accuracy in motion control. But uh, because it tried to exploit the linearity of the system, we cannot increase the step size as many as we want. Usually you see the instantaneous step size. We cannot understand the motion. The, this limitation is more serious once you challenge to the dynamic locomotion such as running because the robot spend uh, half of its uh, locomotion time in the air. Basic philosophy of the whole body control is controlling the floating base by utilizing reaction force coming from the constraint. But in the air, it is non-trivial to think about the, what is the central mass position control because there is no reaction force you can utilize. So we try to integrate the model predictive control and whole body control. Just for the persons who love the whole body control, it doesn't mean that you cannot do the, this type of the behavior with the whole body control. Just it's not very natural as non, and also non-trivial to define all these motions with the only whole body control. And you need some effective motion, uh, high level motion planner, such as model predictive control. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> honestly, it's not very novel ideas to integrate the whole body control and model predictive control. But it's the worst to discuss how to integrate it. Most of the case, people use the MPC as the optimal trajectory generator and whole body control find the reaction force 
track the optimal trajectory. But once you think about what is the running, then you can figure out, uh, find out this is not very good idea, good option in this case. You spend a significant, or overspend a significant amount of the time in the air. So central mass tra tracking task is basically meaningless because literally there is no way to control the center of mass in the air. So we prioritized a task in this way. First, pushing the ground as the MPC found it. And then, uh, and then keeping the whole body posture as long as, this, uh, as long as the reaction force tracking is good enough and swing the leg in a most accurate, accurate way uh, as much as possible. Inspired by the impulse scaling control uh, used in the mini chi uh, Cheetah 2 running and jump, we name it the whole body impulse control. And this is control architecture for dynamic locomotion. Here is the model plate control and the whole body control, which looks similar to the existing uh, control architecture. But there is an important addition, which is reaction force coming from the model grid control and fed into the whole body impulse control. Uh, this might be the simple additions and uh, not very significant improvement, but it takes some time to switch the my philosophy from the trajectory tracking to the reaction force tracking as the persons who spend a uh, long time to develop the whole body control. I didn't describe the, all the detail of the whole body control in this uh, presentation, but it has the two stages. One is kinematics, the other one is the dynamics. In the kinematics space, the whole body control, if uh, compute the joint position and the velocity command, and in dynamics level, whole body control, it calculates the torque. This computed joint position, velocity, and torque command are delivered to the motor controller which run in the 40 kilohertz update frequency. And also you, uh, you might want to look into that each component update frequency. They, are, they have a different update frequency because of the property of each component. And this also good evidence to show that why we need to make a hierarchical uh, control architecture in locomotion controller. And this is the uh, comparison between the whole body control and, and whole body control plus MPC. So you can see the significant uh, improvement in the balance capability. And by the way, this is not RPC the presented by uh, Geraldo. RPC is not fit into the mini Chira's built-in computer. Built-in computer is too small. So we use the convex MPC in this case, in this experiment. Uh, but the, all the videos that Gerald presented has the RPC plus whole body impulse control. Uh, this is the MPC only locomotion uh, behavior, which is not bad at all. Uh, you might think that this is actually worse than the first mini Chira video. At that time, we had uh, uh, some couple of heuristics to enhance the accuracy of the swing leg. But I take off the older heuristics to make sure that uh, uh, to make a compare uh, to make a fair comparison with and without whole body impulse control. And this is the maximum speed you can expect by adding the whole body control. So far, uh, the maximum speed we compressed is three point seven meter per seconds, and now and. In this slow motion video, you can see that we are overlapping between the first uh, front leg and the hind leg. And I want to note that we spend the uh, uh, torque and the power limitation of the actuator, which means that <clears throat> once we have a, a system having the high power and high torque, we can demonstrate even more dynamic behavior dynamic locomotion with the same controller. Let me talk uh, about uh, how, how we integrate the vision system on top of this locomotion controller. 
So we got pretty good success uh, in the blind walking, but to challenge the really extremely rough terrain, then we need to understand the terrain information and react to that, you know, react to the change of the environment by utilizing perception processor. Uh, we added two vision sensors in Mini Chira, as you can see in the left figure. And this is the software, uh, the right side, this uh, software platform is presented. And you can see that we add a perception processor on top of our locomotion controller. <clears throat> when we develop the perception processor, we mainly focus on reducing the computation time and increase the update to frequency because targeted motion is dynamic uh, locomotion on the uh, rough terrain. So we use the only, we take the only one out of the thousand data points. Uh, after building the height map, we uh, apply the simple and efficient filters and categorize the terrain with a gradient. Once the gradient over the some threshold, we make it is non-steppable or non-traversable. This all, all this computation is done in a couple of milliseconds. That's why we got the, uh, this high update frequency, 90, uh, 90 hertz. And we can see, we can detect uh, this uh, pretty, fairly fast object in real time. 90 hertz is the limitation of the hardware. Depth camera is update frequency is 90 hertz which means that our compute processor doesn't spend the almost, you know, almost zero time compared to the update frequency of the hardware. And this is the result of the vision-based locomotion. Here, we commanded the forward velocity to the mini chira, and the mini chira automatically adjusts the step location by utilizing the height information. And you can see that the information visualized in the visual win uh, window. Unfortunately, currently the jumping behavior is initiated manually, which is going to be automated in near future. Uh, this is the more video experiment uh, using the, uh, uh, on top of, on the over the randomly placed wood block. And the maximum height of the wood block is the 10 centimeter. And the, Body clearance is around 27 centimeter. So 10 centimeter is a significant height for the, uh, this scale robot. And we have a basic obstacle avoidance algorithms. Uh, in here, we use the potential field algorithm. It, uh, once you see the obstacle, it has the potential reflective uh, force field changing the, uh, adjusting the, adjusting the uh, movement directions, locomotion direction, as you can see here. You might notice that uh, we have a tethers in the experiment because uh, vision pro perception processor is run in the separate PC. Uh, again, the mini chira built-in computer is not powerful enough to do the more than just the locomotion control. Uh, we tried to build this system in standalone. So we put the every component in this uh, slide inside of the mini chira body. This is new mini chira body and we named it mini chira vision. Now it has the two localization sensors, TX2 and depth camera. And everything is computed inside of the robot. Another important thing is that now we finally can run the Gerardo's RPC in the in the in this robot because TX2 is strong enough to uh, accommodate the RPC. This is preliminary result. Here we use the regularized uh, model uh, predictive control, and the A star is used instead of the potential field algorithm. I wanna share some of the future work. The stair climbing is a big things coming. We are very close. This is a simulations, uh, stepping over the 50 centimeter height uh, stair. 
And uh, once the software is ready, we are going to go outside and do the field test to demonstrate the dynamic locomotion over the rock terrain. And here is the, what I uh, prepared. Thank you for your attention and thank you for everyone in the biomimetic bio robotics lab. Thank you very much. That's exciting work. I can't wait to see the robot going up these stairs. Me too. So maybe we continue now with the questions. Okay. So the first question. Stop sharing. Yeah, in the chat was for Gerardo. Mm -hmm. uh, Demetrios asked about what about torque limitations in the optimization um, and how do you see the effects of that? Um, <clears throat> by having a simplified model? So it, the way that I framed the, uh, the problem, you're using ground reaction forces. So there's no concept of torque. Uh, so we do uh, basically J transpose F to get the torque at the end. Um, so there's no actual torque limits within the optimization. Uh, we have a minimum and maximum ground reaction force that we can exert. Um, so that kind of, covers the torque limits, but also there are obviously cases where uh, the torque might exceed. Um, but we haven't really run into into those. Um, the mini Chuda is like very overpowered. <laughs> so we haven't really run into those just during normal locomotion. OK, maybe a question from my side is, um, so, so all the heuristics that you mentioned, you add them as um, into the objective function. Mm -hmm. so is my question when you look at the solution out of the optimization how much do they deviate from that uh from that heuristic so uh that's kind of a design choice obviously if you make the gain on the heuristic super high it'll basically track them uh pretty much exactly if you make it very low then it basically ignores them uh i kind of chose a midpoint um so a, a lot of what we have kind of debated in our lab is what makes a good controller. Uh, and that's kind of hard to quantify because um, a lot of the measures in classical control that make a good controller are stuff like small rise time, low uh, steady state error, uh, low overshoots. But when you're actually watching a robot move around, it's almost better to let it fluidly deviate from your desired trajectory a little bit rather than immediately try to jerk back onto whatever its intended path is. Uh, so it's kind of an, uh, like a design choice where I actually made it less good as far as a classical controller uh, for smoothness and um, yeah, I guess, I don't know if that answers that, but. <laughs> yes, uh, okay. So it, it, in that sense, um... How do, how do you choose a different heuristic in terms of the problem that you have in hand? Um, so in that case, uh, it's an iterative process. So it's also dependent on whatever heuristics you already have in there. Uh, but basically, I'll run a bunch of different explorations where I'll kind of randomize the inputs a little bit and add some noise. Uh, and say I'm working on high-speed turning, uh, I'll run a bunch of different explorations at different combinations of forward or backwards or lateral. Uh, velocities and turning rates um, and the data should hopefully extract something that works um, and if it works in that case you want to add it into the optimization and run your previous explorations to make sure that the new heuristic hasn't like made performance worse in previous cases okay thanks so the next question is by Min Sung so the heuristic seems to make the controller better but it is it is then limited by whatever controller motion generator is run in simulation. Is the controller, controller in simulation a different controller or the same one without any heuristic? So yes, definitely. Uh, I mean, any kind of uh, learning or any kind of extraction uh, algorithm is going to be dependent on whatever model you run it on. Um, but as far as the controller that you have uh, running in simulation and the controller that we run on the robot, it's exactly the same. Uh, we basically just change a compiler flag that compiles it for the robot versus uh, whatever machine you're working on and you just deploy it the same. Um, but we did spend a lot of effort making the simulation, uh, which is basically a custom simulation that we made um, that 
is pretty accurate to the robot. So we've never had a lot of problems taking something from simulation and putting it on the robot. It usually works pretty much out of the box. Um, but yeah, so to definitely spend a lot of time making sure your simulation is accurate to your robot. So what do you have there in simulation to make it more accurate? What, are, what is the biggest challenge for the simulator? Uh, so something that we didn't find in a lot of commercially um, like available uh, robotic softwares were uh, rotor inertias. So your, your rotor as you're spinning the motors uh, creates effects on the actual body. Uh, and that was kind of hard to input with a lot of commercial uh, solvers that we had. Um, so I don't, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Patrick Wensing, but he did a lot of work to uh, basically add in the rotor inertia to the articulated body algorithm. Uh, so that's what we end up using in our simulation. Okay. The next question is from my side that goes maybe to Gerardo and Dong Young, because in the end, he Dong Young showed um, going up the stairs. For that case, is, does it make sense to have zero roll and zero pitch? So um, I can talk about it from the RPC side. Uh, for most cases, it really doesn't. I was actually surprised uh, how little it actually matters. Um, but also, so you have to note that the zero pitch and roll assumption doesn't mean we're not tracking pitch or roll or that we don't include it in dynamics. Uh, the robot's still like, if you were to hit it upwards, like on its nose, basically, it still knows that it's rotating with pitch and roll. Uh, the place that I make the zero pitch and roll assumption is when converting ground reaction forces uh, and torques from different frames. Uh, I basically tell it that the robot has just yawed, but it hasn't pitched or rolled. Uh, which means that the actual application of force might be in a slightly different location, but unless the robot's like pitched 90 degrees, um, which isn't a case that we're currently tracking uh, or that we're currently targeting, um, then you should be tracking pretty good uh, force results. So we don't, we still have the zero pitch and roll assumption when we're doing slopes and, uh, and stairs. Um, and I actually ended up adding like pitch and roll into the optimization and it didn't make it that much slower, uh, but results weren't any better. Um, so it just wasn't really necessary. Yeah. The next question is, in your opinion, what are the advantages of this nonlinear MPC in the practical performance with respect to the linear version that you presented in the IRO 2018 dynamic locomotion uh, of MIT Cheetah 3? Uh, mm. Which controller you prefer to run on the MIT Cheetah for a real demo. That's, I think, also what Dong Young mentioned during his talk. So yeah. the difference between those two. So um, I had actually started working on the nonlinear version in like 2016. It's, it took basically my whole PhD to get it working on the robot. Uh, and I, I didn't go into too many details, but uh, there's a lot of implementation problems that come with uh, getting a nonlinear optimization to converge reliably and be online fast. Um, so once we had those working, I definitely prefer to run the RPC over the linear MPC uh, online for demos and stuff like that. Um, uh, so a big challenge with that was getting the computer that was uh, fast enough to, to actually handle it um, and basically everything with that. Uh, the advantage and the reason why it actually matters to do the nonlinear case is because you're optimizing footstep locations and ground reaction forces together. And that interaction between where you put the foot and the force that you uh, exert on the ground, um, you're able to take advantage of different moment arms by placing the feet in different locations. Uh, so as far as nominal performance when you're walking around, the two controllers should be basically identical. Uh, there's no real difference between them when you're walking around uh, besides maybe some software engineering differences. Uh, but the case where it really shines is when you like push it in weird complex ways that you haven't uh, been able to take care of with just like a capture point heuristic. The optimization will uh, take care of it in the nonlinear case by putting the foot in a location that you that might be better to put it in. Uh, so you can have the legs crossing, you can have the legs doing weird different things. Uh, so I definitely prefer to run the RPC um, for demos. We've had people come to the lab and given them a stick and said like, try to knock over our robot. And a lot of people actually have trouble knocking it over until basically you pick it up and like throw it. <laughs> okay. Oh, that's 
quite ex impressive. Yeah, and also we are currently preparing the papers to compare the, all these different controllers, so keep in. Mm -hmm. Oh, did like, you already submit this paper? No, oh, sorry, we are currently yeah. writing it. So <laughs> 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 it's not easy to compare the each controller, but you know, yeah. we it's also have good. This. Yeah, it's difficult always... to compare uh, controllers, I think, too, because um, so uh, Jared DiCarlo was uh, the main researcher behind the uh, convex MPC -E, uh, controllers, and he was targeting different things that maybe I was targeting. So controllers are better at two different things, but it might not be inherent to the controller itself. It might just be the design choices that each one of us made uh, when we were doing different things. So it's kind of hard to like. I guess reliably compare different controllers or I guess be fair about it. Um, so we're trying to find a way to do that if anybody has good ideas. Yeah, maybe we can talk about the pipeline. Yeah. yeah. Um, the next question is you mentioned the NLP optimization takes 150 hertz. Is there a low level force controller that runs faster, faster of 100 hertz? Is the, is the force controller frequency as well? Uh, yes, so um, you can think of the MPC as like a more of like a planner uh, that gives you ground reaction forces, but there's a low level uh, controller and there's like a current controller um, and like a leg controller and these each run at different frequencies. Um, but 150 hertz is actually plenty fast to, uh, to run the optimization. The convex MPC case, I think actually ran at 30 hertz and that that performance was great. Um, so 150 might be overkill, but it's better to be faster than not if you can. <laughs> yeah. Dimitrios asks um, it, that it seems like it looks like that the robot sometimes steps in the blue high gradient places. Is it due to the state estimation errors? Nice catch. <laughs> <laughs> so state estimator uh, can be, but uh, it's mainly because the stepping down motion. Currently, we don't have the collision checking of the scene versus terrain. So once it you know, choose that kind of the place, then scene start to hitting the ground or any obstacles, which make the another disturbance to the robot. So as long as it is a stable uh, regions, a stable states, then it doesn't make that kind of uh, mistake. Another thing is you can, I mean, uh, another problem is that the leg swing neck swing location control is only a couple of centimeter accuracy. So there is the still the possibility to take step over the uh, blue region. And in that sense, how do you adjust for the feet height and the location based on the height map? So the next question. we have a we have equations to choose the what is the next full location. So basically it's a free to get the information. Once we pick that the landing location, then we check if it is safe or not. And then if it is not safe, then it's you, uh, the planner is finding the spider search until it leads to the safe uh, location. And then uh, once we pick that the safe location, you can see that the height information from the height map. So that is that's X, Y, Z information goes in, back into the swing neck control. Uh -huh. and that's how we adjust the swing foot. Yeah, that's also going into that direction goes the next question who asks to have more specifics about how you choose that one region is a stable region and the other one is not. Uh, as I said in the presentations, we check the gradient of the each grid. So height map is 100 by 100 uh, grid. And all the points is uh, we make the gradient map for the entire map. And once the gradient over the some threshold, which means that it's a stiff uh, terrain, and we identify it as a not safe place to step in on. And also if it goes above the some other threshold, which means that the, there is a really steep terrain, uh, then we don't want to go through the terrain, then it's non-traversable. That's how we categorize the terrain. Um, okay. 
So the next question is to Gerardo about the NL, which NLP solver are you using? And for him, just to confirm, the heuristic is mainly there to help you not to fall into local minimas, or is the heuristic also good for something else? Uh, okay, so as far as the NLP solver, it's IP opt, uh, and the, we're using the C++ interface, um, and that gives us good performance. Uh, as far as the second part of the question, um, the, so the heuristic, it definitely does help you avoid a uh, local minimum. Um, so I'm a big believer in finding a good enough working solution rather than some sort of optimal solution. Uh, cause it, even if you find the absolute global optimal solution of your cost function, the cost function itself might not be what you actually want it to be. Uh, it's just designed by whatever design like human or control engineer, um, is designing it. Uh, so the heuristic is meant to make the cost function, uh, something meaningful and something that comes from physics rather than just, uh, desired minus actual velocity or something like that. So I'm kind of trying to make the, the optimization, uh, like dynamics rich as far as the cost function while also not adding complexity to it. Okay. And All right, can I ask a quick follow-up, Marco? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, in terms of the cost function heuristics, I, I, and this is definitely something you have to do in robots is that art of implementation. And, and in some ways, encoding everything in one place is really nice because you know exactly where it is and what to change. Mm -hmm. Do you have any intuition about how difficult it might be to formulate this to make uh, theoretic guarantees? So, I mean, I understand about, you know, trying to find global optimum and things like that. That's not so relevant. The question is, could you give, for example, a class of heuristics that guarantee stability in steady state walking? I mean, do you see connections with the formal gate analysis? Um, I personally haven't looked into it too much. Uh, I've kind of avoided this question a little bit during my whole PhD because uh, I, I make absolutely no guarantees, uh, basically just trying and seeing if it works on the robot. Um, it's it's like a very complex. So even though like the system models eat, are uh, pretty simple and the heuristics are simple, when you put it all together, it's a little difficult to make uh, formal guarantees on it. Um, so I've kind of avoided that. Um, but I'm sure I'm sure you could probably analyze them. Uh, everything's pretty simple in form and like intuitive. Um, but I personally haven't done any work with that. Have you have you checked the numerics like? It'd be interesting just to take a steady state walking gate running your heuristics and check the eigenvalues of the Poincaré map, right? That's mm -hmm. something that you could do pretty quickly. Just the numerical stability of, of steady state behaviors. Yeah. Pure the heuristic. Um, so a, a few of the heuristics actually come from, um, like I have the extracted heuristics that come from running the uh, simulation in like difficult cases, but those mm -hmm. cases, um, that was only needed when we already had good performance on the robot um, for say like steady state walking. We're using things like the inverted pendulum model um, and things that have been analyzed in depth yeah, um, and checked, for all that yeah. kind of stuff. Okay. All right. Great. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. We have lots of questions here still to go. So the next question is, is the motion control loop at 50 kilohertz tracking 500 hertz position and velocity set points with torque feed forward. Is 500 hertz not fast enough to close the position velocity loop at the level, or is there another reason you made that architecture decision? So, really good question. Updated frequency question is always hard to answer. Is it really fast enough or not? I think 500 hertz is not fast enough to control the accurate torque and the joint position. Another reason is that we have already 40 kilohertz update uh, uh, motor controller, and there is no reason not to use. Another, uh, so once it goes fast, like uh, three meters per second running, then it is uh, hard to say which component actually make this control worse. And then the one choice we can take is making everything is so maximum, uh, go to the maximum performance. That's why uh, that, that is the 
why we choose the 40 kilohertz of data frequency here instead of the making the closed loop in the high level controller. Another reason is that once you see that the, what is the moment actual joint position control start to vibrate, it gives you uh, the good intuition of what is the uh, required uh, update frequency. Once you have a 40 kilohertz update frequency, you can use the really stiff position control in the joint level. And then torque control, definitely torque bandwidth of the mini chira is around 20 or 30 hertz. And then more importantly, tested amp is near to the maximum torque. So 40 kilohertz is definitely desirable options for us. Thank you. So the next question was already answered by Gerardo. So what kind of optimization algorithm do you use? And it's IPO. Um, then the next question is, do you think that some of the heuristics you have found are specific to the, MI, to the mini cheetah or would you be the same for a bigger quadruped? For example, spot or let's say um, the big cheetah. Did you ever test your algorithm on the big cheetah? And if yes, do you see some major differences? Uh, so the answer to that is definitely yes. Uh, pretty much, so I spent four years in, uh, in the lab working on this algorithm. Uh, and I spent three and a half of it working on getting this algorithm to run on the big cheetah. Um, and I have a couple of videos of it working on the big cheetah with basically the same exact heuristics. Uh, there might be some parameter differences that are automatically taken care of with the uh, parameter learning. Uh, I didn't talk about it too much in this presentation, but it's in the paper. Um, but the same exact heuristic models are input in the big cheetah as they are in the little cheetah. Um, but the big cheetah, unfortunately, uh, we overheated the computer. And so it hasn't been run in like a year, probably at this point, probably more than that. Um, but then I got it working on the mini cheetah and the mini cheetah is just so much nicer to work with. Um, so all the videos are with the mini cheetah, but all of the work was done for the big cheetah. Um, I adapted basically a couple mass inertia and leg length parameters and the controller just worked immediately on the little robot. So, so, so what is actually the future for the big cheetah now? Now that you mentioned it's not running for a year, <laughs> I think yeah. now the combination of having the mini cheetah, you can go first in simulation, then test it on the mini cheetah. And then if this all nicely works, you could test it on the big robot to get some uh, more results. So what is there, the strategy in your lab? So, so the big cheetah, um, like I said, we burnt out the computer. Uh, so really all we needed to do was replace the, uh, the uh, embedded CPU, um, but we decided to take the opportunity to basically redo the entire body, uh, make it much easier to like get to different parts of the robot, uh, make it look a lot nicer. Uh, so it's currently under construction again, uh, and hopefully it should have a very nice body that's, it's already been designed and everything, we just need to get it up and running. Uh, but due to all this virus stuff, it's kind of hard to get in the lab and actually work on it. So. Oh. Great. I can't wait to see results again on the big cheetah as well. Yeah, it, lo it looks very nice, the, the body, uh, the design. So, Okay. So the next question is for Dong Yong. Do you use the vision to improve the robot position state estimator? Does the state estimator still use the Karma filter based from the Cheetah 3 design and control paper? Uh, no. So we are using the vision sensors to improve the robot position and estimation because we need a global location of the robot to uh, stitching the point cloud data. Uh, it is not possible to use, to get the global location with only kinematics and the IMU acceleration. First of all, IMU acceleration, I'm not very convinced by that data. Uh, kinematics is also problematic because once you sleep, even though it is a centimeter slip, that means that uh, you have a centimeter error in the global location estimation. So we use the tracking sensor, tracking rear sensors. So the Kalman filters finally uh, use the kinematics, height of the foot, IMU acceleration, and the uh, two localization sensor. We mix all together to get the position and velocity. Okay, thanks. The next question is regarding the backflip problem. 
Controlling the roll angle is crucial. Crucial Landing can be hugely affected when the ground is uneven. Can the flip be carried out in such conditions? The answer is no. Uh, current backflip is just the replay of the optimized trajectory. So once you change the initial position, then it's not going to flip as you, can, as you expect it. Landing is a little different. Uh, currently we have the joint only joint position control based landing, but there is another landing algorithm which we didn't visit it that much, but there is the better landing algorithm. So if the landing location is tilted a little, then we we can accommodate that tilting angles pretty a lot. Okay. <clears throat> And I think the next question is quite a general question. Do you think a robot enthusiastic maker could easily learn and use either of your approaches on his own robot? And how much time do you think it would take to grasp these concepts? For example, for someone with a mechanical engineering degree. Um, so I guess I can talk generally about that. I mean, obviously it depends person to person how actually enthusiastic you are. Uh, but I don't think, um, like, I guess it might be kind of bad to say, but a lot of the ideas that I came up with were specifically because I didn't have that strong of a formal training going into my research as some people might. Um, but I thought that worked to my advantage, uh, cause I wasn't constrained to doing the same techniques that everybody else was doing. Um, and I like, I didn't know that nonlinear optimization was a difficult problem to solve. So I was like, oh, this just makes sense to do. Uh, so I just went for it. Um. So I think there is some value in exploring things outside of like what you might learn in a class or something like that. Um, and I think it's also definitely valuable to gain the correct background um, and fill in any gaps that you might have. Uh, but I think, I mean, if you're enthusiastic enough, I think you can probably learn whatever you want. Um, so I think, yeah, uh, the concepts itself for the RPC is not very difficult. I think it's actually very simple and intuitive. Um, Implementation, I think, is the more difficult part. Um, but as far as concept, I think it's a pretty simple concept that like, hopefully is easy to grasp. If you didn't get it from this presentation, uh, I think the paper itself, and I have, I think, like four papers on RPC. Uh, and I think if you go through all of them, it should hopefully be easy to, uh, to understand. So I guess that's my perspective. <laughs> Uh, let me add uh, one more comment. We have a public repository including convex MPC and whole body impulse control. So you can just download it and uh, run it and you're good to go. Yep. That's, that's great. Okay. Oh, I have, we have one final question for Dong Yong. For whole body control, the control structure seems fairly complex. How difficult is the implementation and how does the debugging process go? Okay, compared to the RPC, implementation is nothing. Whole body impulse control is a one header file and one CPP file, that's all. And the uh, uh, control structure seems fairly complex uh, for the first time, but once you, once you think that whole body control is some kind of the black box, taking the position command and then uh, uh, give you the torque command, then you don't need to actually worry about the, that much details. Because it's a well established the solution. And then there is a many uh, public repository. Again, there is the public repository from the MIT, which, which you can download it. And is it to, I believe it is easy to integrate with your controller. Okay. I get and when things go bad, where, where do you look suspect the first? Yeah. Honestly, 90% of the bug uh, error coming from your bug. Yeah. Not many cases, not formulation issue. Mm -hmm. But once this goes wrong, then uh, first things we can look into the, the feedback gain. And then you take up the one component one by one uh, until you see that uh, some, some behavior you expected. For instance, uh, we have the, the uh, switch, turn on and turn off the whole body control. So you can see that the MPC only control is still working. 
before you turn on the whole body control. That's the one way to debug. Okay, great. Thanks for giving us your time for such a, I think that was the longest presentation we had here. <laughs> we all also had two people, so I think that fits quite well. Thank you again for joining. And I Thank hope you. to see soon more of your results. Yeah, great. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you for the great presentation, guys. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. See you guys. Bye. Thank you guys. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for the presentation.